Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first panel of the day, uh, the LNG uh, panel. Uh, we'll kick off by, by giving a quick introduction. First off, uh, on the left-hand side, we have Christos Economo of Cardiff Gas. Then we have Richard Tyrell of Hoge LNG Partners, uh, Morten Nielsen, the pool manager for the Cool Pool, and last but not least, Jon Skule, the CEO of Avilco LNG. So the LNG market has been very challenging for the past few years, um, largely due to vessels being delivered ahead of the projects. Um, but now we're facing some exciting times. Uh, we're, we're facing the largest volume increase perhaps seen in modern shipping history as more than 100 million tons of liquefaction capacity comes on stream. So I think the general consensus now is that we're going to be 30 to 40 vessels short uh, by the end of this decade. So I'd like to start with you, Jon, um, and, and how you see the market balance going forward and also how you see the changing market dynamics affecting freight rates in the years to come. Uh, thank you for a very good question. Uh, I think um, it's fair to say that we've been through, um, we've been through very, very challenging times and, uh, and uh, things are looking a lot better. Uh, as you said, there's more than 100 million tons of LNG hitting the water over the next uh, three years. Uh, there's uh, a restrained uh, order book, uh, and I think that's going to continue. Uh, until charters start uh, biting the bullet and, and taking long-term charters. So uh, the, uh, the oversupply of tonnage, which we have struggled with over the last uh, couple of years, uh, looks to be uh, diminishing, and uh, hopefully uh, and, and likely going forward, this will uh, obviously um, lead to stronger rates. Anyone else want to comment? Jonathan? Sorry, I was late. <laughs> I think the question was the... Uh, well, the, the I'll, I'll, uh, I'll come with another question. <laughs> you know, historically we've seen some, some project delays. We've, we've seen some, some recently as well. Yeah. Do you think this is going to push the recovery story even further out? Or is there enough volumes coming in? I think that um, there's enough volumes coming. And I think there's a lot of attention that's placed on project delays. And a lot of times people think that LNG is, you know, the projects are always delayed, the ships are always on time. But um, if you look back over the past four years, nine projects have come online, only two of them have been delayed. And if you look at the, the projects that are currently under construction, coming online either uh, on schedule or even ahead of schedule, there are a couple that have announced delays. Um, but one of those still has yet to secure four to five ships. Um, so I don't think that uh, overall it will have that great an impact. Um, from the, the spot market uh, kind of recovery uh, perspective, it may, it may affect things by a few months, but, uh, but not in a significant way. Okay, and I want to touch a bit on, on what we're seeing in the market. If you look back several years, we maybe had contracts, uh, supply contracts of 20 years uh, with large volumes. Now we're seeing you know, shorter uh, supply contracts, much less volume. How is this impacting the market? Uh, Christos, you want to take this one? Um, well, if you take the spot cargoes and the spot ships, uh, which I think is what you're driving towards, uh, I would say that there's probably a 30-35% uh, increase on fixtures. So if anything, it's, it's positive for shipping, uh, especially spot shipping, as if you do not know where your end demand is, then you have a lot more flexibility, uh, a lot less flexibility on planning. So I would say the ADPs of the suppliers are fixed in advance. However, you know, if the demand center is not known, that helps spot. So overall, that is net positive for spot shipping. Okay. And I'm just curious in terms of, we've seen the, the supply contracts change. We're also seeing, um, call it the charter contracts change. We're now seeing much more uh, you know, shorter term contracts than we used to, do, used to do. So can we discuss a bit about the residual risk you have as an owner today if you charter out the vessel for, let's say, five to seven years at, at $70,000 a day? Sure. 
I mean, contractually, uh, as you said, LNG has traditionally been um, midstream um, business. So, you know, seven to 15 year contracts. Uh, as with all shipping sectors, at some point, once the product becomes commoditized, um, the actual um, sh ship, ship, shipping uh, cycle, the shipping term becomes a lot smaller. So I would say the typical duration now on, 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 on charters is much less, five to seven years, and there's uh, a, a spot market that didn't exist when, when we entered the business in 2011. So when we entered the business in 2011, the, at that point in time, there was probably five to eight ships in the spot market. It's not, not, not that many. Now it's 50 to, to 60, so there's actu an actual market. Now, managing the residual value for me is, 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 is a great discussion. We cannot manage the residual value, but what we can do is maximize our earnings and you know, enter the, the space at a good price. So we, you know, we buy as an owner in, in other asset classes, we buy low, and then you know you manage the, the, the residual that way. Otherwise, how can you manage? <laughs> Morton, do you have anything to add to that? To the residual value? Well, I'm primarily doing spot these days, so uh, not really. But uh, I think we all know it's there. Yeah. And, and Richard, what have you mentioned about the the contract, the supply contracts? You know, we're seeing shorter supply contracts, uh, maybe less volumes. Is how is this impacting your market, the FSRU market? Sure. Let me just say a few words about Herg LNG. Uh, we're, we're more in the FSIU space, which uh, is at the delivery end um, of the value chain. Uh, so we have the uh, what are effectively LNG carriers that have regasification equipment on board, and uh, we take deliveries from a regular LNG carrier of, of LNG, and we uh, warm it up, and we uh, pressurize it, and uh, send it out in, into the grid. And uh, what that means uh, is that FSIU customers are typically utilities uh, as opposed to the upstream players. Uh, and they, um, being utilities, have a slightly longer term um, perspective. Uh, so um, in regards to your question on, on the contract duration, um, you know, we are still seeing relatively long term um, contracts. There is a range. Uh, we've um, uh, signed 20-year contracts recently. We've signed five-year contracts uh, recently. Um, but um, broadly speaking, uh, the contracts in the FSIU space are longer, uh, which, uh, which is obviously um, a benefit, particularly when it comes to residual risk. And um, a benefit to me, because I run the MLP part of the business, which is dependent on stable uh, long-term cash flows to pay out its 9% uh, yield. Thank you. Um, asking uh, at least four LNG owners uh, what they think of the market, I think we're going to get a very unanimous answer. So I think I want to touch up on something that you may not agree on, which is the propulsion systems. And Jonathan, you have six Megis uh, on order. They're going to be the dominant force in the spot market, or your, the Megis you have uh, will be the dominant force in the spot market, many believe, um, and you're going to control that spot market. Do you think it's possible that the Megis will see, you know, a 10, 15, 20,000 premium uh, compared to the other ships? Well, first off, um, while it would be nice to control the market, I don't think anybody can do that. Um, so, but but as far as the the difference in in the propulsion, the fuel efficiencies, size, and and uh, kind of boil off rates. Um, we, we, we do see that there's a, a definite um, spread between the various vessel types and, and propulsions. There's a two, two tier market right now between steam propulsion vessels and the, the TFDEs or tri fuel diesel electrics. And we expect that once there are the two stroke vessels, our Maggie's and, and others, XDF vessels. Um, We'll, we'll see kind of a three-tiered market. Um, and uh, we have um, seen it already where we, where we have uh, a contract uh, for a TFDE vessel, but we have an option to swap in one of our new bills at a rate premium. So, so we know that it is achievable. Anyone disagrees? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll position it in the following way. The actual um, ship... Average cargo size is 160,000. 
So um, that is your bread and butter. Uh, now, out of the U.S., some contracts you can top up, but at uh, these prices, nobody really wants to, obviously, because a lot of the trades are uh, are negative. So you know, the size difference of a TFD versus a Meggy is not really there. Uh, at some point, it will be. Um, now, at the same time, the TFDs in the market today are the spot market. So yes, you know, there are, you know, maybe, I don't know, today, three Meggies in the spot market that are actually trading and not on term. And there is probably 50 TFDs. So uh, uh, your incremental fixture out of the US will go on the Meggies if they have an, the ability to make money on that. It doesn't mean that they will get the, the, the money that you are talking about. So, you know, we believe that with the options that we have on our ships, that difference is, is depending on the speed, uh, is, is actually minuscule. Uh, now, of course, uh, you know, you have to look at the specific ships. Uh, when TK ordered these Meggy ships back in 2000, and, um, I think it was 13, uh, DSME was going bankrupt at the time or wanted to place some orders. So they were selling basically these ships as the next, you know, best thing that happened. So, uh, yes, there are some competitive advantages, but there are also some disadvantages um, to that. So it's very cargo, uh, I would say, and customer specific. Uh, now, overall, if I were to say what is the best propulsion today, um, I would go with the XDFs because those are ships that in the end are two stroke, uh, have all the advantages of the Meggies and have an active containment system versus a passive, which for me is very important as a ship owner because it manages the ability to preserve the cargo, which is what the actual customer wants. So, you know, John, sorry to disappoint you, but <laughs> at least in the way I'm saying this, but I, I agree that the, the Meggies definitely have advantages. But if they were ten to fifteen thousand, then um, you know everybody, um, everybody would. The, the customer doesn't pay for that difference. The customer just says, first ship fixed, you're out." It doesn't say, "I will pay you, you know, X amount more because you have uh, a greater, better ship." And we can always compare TCs at the end of the year and see who acted better. <laughs> Indeed, Jon, is that something uh, you agree with? Uh, not all of it. Uh, I think it's uh, it's very obvious that uh, Megis are somewhat better than than Trifills, but it does very much depend on the on the trade. Uh, there are certainly trades where uh, Trifills uh, have an advantage. Uh, as today, we still see uh, old uh, steamships uh, built uh, early two thousand or or even before still trading. Uh, you know, from a financial point of view, uh, it might not uh, make sense to all of us, but uh, but they still they're still out there and. And uh, I think that's, um, you know, a theoretical advantage the Megis do have uh, is, is for sure. Uh, we'll see uh, as they hit the water uh, how much it is and, and how big it is. Morten, how do you, how do you see these uh, vessels? You have a very um, um, homogeneous fleet. Um, how do you see uh, the, the, the market going forward? Is it going to be a, a two-tiered, three-tiered, uh, or any comments to, to what the other guys uh, mentioned? Uh. I think in the spot market, it's it's very difficult to uh, to divide it in in that way. I mean, we have seen steamships get higher rates than 174s, and we have seen 174s get higher rates than than than, than trifuels. So in that sense, I agree with with Christos that it's very much cargo driven, and I think for the bigger vessels to get a full advantage, uh, it comes down to how much volume will the charter need to lift. Uh, definitely that's more important than, than whatever propulsion is on board. Uh, that said, I think I think all propulsions have a future. Uh, I think the market is, you haven't seen speculative orders for a while. Um, I think steamships, there are a lot of steamships, modern steamships built in 2000 something, that will play a role. Uh, they will lift cargoes, they will get uh, good returns. Um, is a 15 year old ship still modern? <laughs> Yeah, I would say they have 20 years to live. Okay. <laughs> if I was 15, I was young. Anyway, um, so I think uh, I, I, it becomes, uh, I had a, a boss who liked to use the frame uh, mental masturbation, but, but there's something about it because uh, the market will need all the ships. Uh, some charters prefer the big ships. Uh, the fuel consumption advantages can be questioned on some trades. Uh, so um, 
Yeah, sometimes they will make more, sometimes they will make less. So you definitely believe there's a future for the steam vessels even, Abs even 10 years ahead? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, these ships are built to last for 40 years, right? Um, you haven't seen, if you look outside uh, Flex LNG, you haven't seen a lot of speculative orders for, for a long time. Um, you will have, it takes three years to build a ship. So, uh, of course, they'll play a role. I have no doubt about it. Well, now, before we move over to the FSRU side, I, I want to touch quickly on uh, a bit on, on the on the pricing mechanisms in the LNG market. So, uh, maybe you want you want to you want to go ahead and, and do you believe it's room for higher transportation costs in a low gas price environment, or do you fear that we may see uh, call it uh, the same thing that happened on the LPG side with the lack of price differentials or arbitrage, arbitrage, if you will? Yeah, that's a very good question. We've been. Uh uh, you know, we've been through a period where, with high gas prices, which uh, where uh, you know basically it's, it's supply demand of ships uh, and nothing else that uh, that drives uh, drives the rates. Uh, and of course, that is a, a, a an issue now that gas prices are, are low. That said, um, gas prices at the offtake can can of course be lower uh, if that's what it takes. And, and I think that's what we're seeing now, where where the market is gradually improving. The, uh, the spread is also uh, improving to accommodate uh, higher rates, but it does take a bit longer than, than if demand was, uh, was the driving factor. Any comments? I think uh, one of the other aspects with the, with the LNG business is that the, the cargo uh, contracts are largely uh, take or pay type of contracts or uh, some with, with uh, tolling arrangements and things like that which is a bit different than the LPG market. And, and so with the, the take or pay obligations by the, the buyers or, or end users, um, the, the cargos have to get lifted. Uh, so much of the CapEx for an LNG liquefaction project, you know, is already invested in the, in the project. And the, the, the project proponents, of course, want to produce the LNG and make sure that that it gets lifted so that their uh, their customers are uh, you know paying for the cargos and they're recovering the the capital for the for the project. So I think from that perspective, from that perspective, it's a bit different than the the LPG world. And I have a comment to that. I think I think of course, right? I mean, when you've seen <clears throat> sometimes when you've seen the highest DLCC rates, uh, the oil price has been twenty dollars. Uh, when when I joined LNG 12 years ago, everything was long-term projects, and delivered price was four dollars, and ships got seventy-five thousand dollars per day for 30 years. Right. So freight was 25, 30 percent of the cargo price. So traders and, and and projects have been used to cheap shipping. Uh, they've taken it as as a given. Um, but of course, you can you can still make a trade work at much higher freight. It's just about how you cut the pie. Thank you. Um, we need to move over a bit on, on the FSRU side. Um, the entrance of FSRU has had a massive impact for, for many countries, helping them uh, open up for new, uh, for new imports. Um, so Richard, I'm interested in, with so many new countries having already opted for the FSRU option, where do you see um, the biggest potential going forward? Sure. I, mean, I think I'd say that, uh, I wouldn't say so many countries. I think there's uh, a, lot, a lot more to come. Yeah. Um, I think uh, last year, the total uh, LNG volumes that went through FSIUs was just over 30 million tons <coughs> per annum, which uh, is about the same as what went into uh, India and about the same as what went into um, China. Uh, and of that, 30 million that went through FSIUs, a substantial amount, I think six to eight, was going into Egypt. Uh, and uh, Egypt is going to take slightly less uh, going forward. So, you know, where else was it going? A lot to Egypt, um, uh, some to Brazil, uh, some to um, elsewhere in Latin America, um, some to uh, Lithuania. We've got an asset, uh, asset there. Um, but, the, but, the, but the FSIU that was really operating at 100% utilization uh, was, was Egypt. And it's not just one FSIU, that was two, because BW have got an FSIU there as well. Um, you know, going forward, um, there's two kinds of markets. There's existing gas markets, uh, which have got declining, typically local production for whatever reason, that are able to take a lot of LNG very, very quickly. So those kinds of markets, places like Pakistan, 
uh, to a lesser extent, Bangladesh and, and, and India. And uh, those are the kind of places where you're going to see a big ramp up. Um, Pakistan now has one, FSIU, it's going to have another one uh, very shortly, and then uh, we've got one going there uh, next year. Uh, and uh, those places are places which have existing gas demand, whether it be industrial, whether it be power gen related, whether it be uh, transportation in the case of Pakistan, where they have a big conversion uh, of, the, of the cars, uh, cars that are running on compressed natural gas. Um, so those markets get up and going very quickly. Then you have the sort of new gas markets, uh, and that's where uh, there's a bit of a drag, uh, quite frankly, because even though LNG uh, on all fundamental grounds looks very, very attractive, of course, at the moment, they've got power coming from somewhere. And uh, typically, it's either uh, fuel oil or it's, uh, or it's coal. And uh, the people who are in control of those markets at the moment, the last thing they want to see is LNG come in. Uh, and uh, they fight like crazy to stop it and put up all sorts of barriers to entry. So when I'm asked about competition, I'll probably say, well, we haven't got that much competition necessarily from other FSIU companies, but we do have competition to get into markets because LNG has competition to get into markets. And those are the kind of markets like the African markets, the uh, Asian markets, and to maybe a lesser extent, the Latin American markets. So far, there has been a lot of talk for, for new entrants in this market, but little action. Um, if they eventually come, uh, and Jonathan, I'll give this one to you. You've, you've uh, spoken about FSRUs before. Um, do you think the, the rates we have seen with 35 to $45 million EBTA, EV EBTA seven to eight times, uh, is that still feasible going forward, or um, will rates come down eventually? Well, I think if, if the, the market gets flooded with new entrants, then obviously uh, that would that would probably be the case, but I think, uh, like Richard said, that the the, the competition uh, is is not that that great. There are a lot of um, barriers to to entry into the FSRU space. Um, you know, an FSRU project is really not a shipping project. It's a it's an infrastructure project, and uh, it's much more complex. There's a lot more that goes into the business development and uh, project management side of things. Um, but could could the uh, could the rates come off a bit? They they may, and and part of that is uh, also related to the fact that the the underlying cost of an LNG of, of an FSRU these days has come off. And how do you view the the new build uh, versus conversion aspect here? Um, Richard Hoeg has uh, gone for new builds all the way. Um, yeah, we've gone gone for new builds. Uh, all, all the way. Um, and now I think you've got a market which uh, is split into three. You've got uh, the older uh, conversions, uh, which are uh, typically 120,000 cubic meters in capacity, and they simply don't fit well within today's value chain, where the average LNG carrier is 160,000 uh, cubic meters. So the, the older uh, conversions are typically going to find new, new work um, uh, on smaller projects. Um, and they aren't necessarily what um, we wouldn't necessarily expect to see them competing for from our projects. Um, you've then got the sort of second generation vessels uh, where uh, they um, they can compete. They're a little bit inefficient, but of course they just uh, adjust their day rate uh, to, to reflect that. And because this is very much a project driven market, the uh, customers can. Well, they spend a lot of time comparing, and they say, okay, well, you know, we're going to be at this price, um, they're at that price, you know, they're a little bit less efficient, and it all balances out. And uh, uh, that's, that's, you know, how they compete, and they can very much compete on, on that basis. And then you've got the new bills uh, where um, you don't have that, um, that, that, that inefficiency type, uh, type question. Um, and, uh, and that's where we are, um, and intend to stay. And do you think we'll see a big difference for, call it, the first and second generation vessels moving ahead? Not in the same way that uh, you've, well, <laughs> that we'll potentially see in the LNG carrier space. Uh, in, when, first of all, with a FSIU, you need electricity to run the regas equipment. So that makes the tri-fuel um, or, or, or DFGs much more um, practical because you need, you need power. Um, and uh, when we're running one of our vessels, we'll be running on, more often than not, only one engine out of four, maybe two. So we're not sailing through the seas at 19 knots. Um, and uh, therefore, the actual um, propulsion um, question, which I think where most of the technology has been focused, isn't so relevant in the FSIU business. 
Thank you. Um, I want to move quickly over uh, to, to the yard prices. Um, you know, we've seen the big yards reducing capacity uh, as turmoils in, in offshore and many maritime segments, and we've seen asset values across the board come down. Uh, Morten, do you, do you think we have, is, is there room now for further reductions in new building prices, or have we already hit the bottom? I, I'm probably not the right guy because, I mean, we're not really active in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the new building market, in the pool, so I haven't, I'm not up to date on that one, to be honest. Christos, do you have any views? Um, yes, I think as the previous speaker, which I believe was Adam Kent, correctly said, uh, you know, yards are under um, distress. They're cutting their sales force. Um, you know, the trade is just about to rebound in most uh, sectors. So I would say now is the, 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 the low time. Now, you know, plus minus uh, six months, uh, you know, usually is, 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 is a good estimate. Um, so it, 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 is, it, is, it, is, it is a good time. I mean, but traditionally, LNG carriers have been ordered at above um, 200 million. So anything below that is, is pretty good. Um, so I would say, yes, you know, the, 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 I, I don't expect the prices to go a lot lower than where they are, except if we say, see some major currency, uh, except if we see steel price coming off, which I don't think uh, is going to come off uh, as much as, as uh, or, or exchange rate. And, you know, if those are two variables, but otherwise I would say the, the yards, you know, the Korean yards produce 75% of all capacity. Uh, and of international trade, they're probably 98%. And they will not, in my view, lower their prices too much. You agree with that, John? Yeah, I think so. Uh, prices right now are, are the lowest they've been in, in say, the last eight years, uh, not the lowest they've ever been. Um, and, and if you look back at uh, the uh, LNG ships that have been ordered over the years, uh, the, the price really hasn't varied that much. Uh, even though the, the technologies change. Um, but uh, as far as the, you know, kind of pulling back on, on capacity, I think the yards are fairly flexible. And, and if the demand were there, they could, they could expand. Um, but yeah, I think that the, right now the, the, the prices are, uh, have come off um, quite a bit and, and probably don't have a whole lot more, more room to go. Okay. Um, just a bit back on, on the on the order book again. We've uh, we have some some hundred vessels there today. Um, the new building contracting year to date has been has been very low. Um, so, for for the trains that don't have committed vessels yet, do you think they will opt for for new builds now, or do you think they will actually go out and try to, to take vessels already in the, already in the market? Well, we look at um, the projects that are coming online and uh, the, the ships that are yet to be contracted to fulfill those, that LNG supply that will be coming into the market. Uh, and, and basically right now, uh, it would be hard to get a 2019 delivery. If you did, it would be very end of 2019. So um, there are, are quite a few charterers uh, that are going to need uh, vessels within the 2019 time frame. So they will have to draw from the uh, either the existing order book of uncommitted vessels or from the existing fleet. So I think from from that perspective there you know there's definitely uh, going to be a mix of, of vessel types that, that get chartered. Um, you know of course a strategy that that could be employed is, is a a shorter term uh, deal that uh, that is a bridge to a new building, um, but we but we do see excess demand for vessels based on the supply that's coming uh, that is uh, coming sooner than you could do a new build. So, so it seems you all are, are quite bullish on, on the market outlook, but. Um, where is all this gas going? Where do you think, Morton, where will be the biggest trades? Will this market become good even if all the American gas just ends, gets dumped in, into Europe? Will, will that be enough? Uh, yes. <laughs> That's a very short answer. And I think we have seen, uh, if you take some of the trades we have seen in the last couple of years, the, the, the distances has not been that long. Uh, but the, 
the time the vessels has been reserved uh, may have been uh, have been a lot longer than than uh, than a project vessel, for example. Um, I mean, if we look at our data, it's quite logical. If you have a project vessel uh, going from A to B for 20 years, it's very easy to schedule around it. Uh, if you have if you're dependent on ships in the spot market, which I think most projects will be in the future, perhaps not, of course, not for 100% of their volumes, but let's say for 25, 30% of their volumes, then the utilization of the ships in the spot market will never be as efficient. Uh, and going back to the point, Qatar, Egypt, for example, it's been a very normal trade for the last couple of years. Well, ships reserved for that trade has still been off the market for five, six weeks. And in a market where there's excess supply. Uh, charters have not paid for that inefficiency. But in a China market, they will pay for it. So from a shipping perspective, whether it goes to Egypt or China or Europe or Argentina or wherever the future trades will end up, um, I think from a rate perspective, it's more interesting to see how the owners react and, uh, and how we price the idle time. Because the idle time would be there. It's in the definition of the spot market. Um, I think... Everyone here has been surprised about uh, how much volume China has taken this year. They've taken a lot more than I think any trader has, has anticipated. Um, but in the spot market, the impact has not been huge uh, because it's been either death sales or it's been on going back to propulsion uh, steamships. So I think from a demand perspective, it's not really important uh, because uh, distances become less important. Of course, uh, if everything went from west to east at a round trip, it would be good. But because of the inefficiencies in the spot market, the distances are not that important. Uh, so uh, we, think, we think rates will go up irrespective of, of, of how long uh, the cargoes will travel. Okay. You and ask and I, would, I, would, I, would, I would say I could prove it, but uh, we don't have enough time. <laughs> uh, do you have, what are your biggest fear? You know, what are the biggest risks that this recovery is, is, not, um, is not coming? I'm not, uh, I'm not thrilled about talking about risk or fear. Uh, right now, we, my fear is that we, uh, you know, we've been through hell and we're not going to get out, but we are going to get out. Uh, that's, that's quite obvious. I mean, it... Um, uh, you know, as, as you mentioned, there's 100 million tons of LNG hitting the water. Uh, how can you be afraid? Uh, it's that simple. And, and, and I, I totally agree with Morton. I think uh, ton time, as we call it, more than ton miles, <clears throat> is becoming more and more important. And uh, the inefficiency in, 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 um, in the, uh, from the LNG um, projects uh, is uh, fortunately uh, phenomenal. Of course, that will improve over time. Uh, and also as... As LNG gets uh, more commoditized, we'll see uh, new routes. We'll see uh, you know different uh, trading patterns, and and uh, thereby also less efficiency than than the projects have been used to over the last uh, 20, 30, 40 years. Perfect. Thank you very much. I think that's one second left, so I think we'll uh, we'll stop there. Thank you very much to our uh, our panel. Thank you.